This is Jocko Podcast number 204. With Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. By virtue of the authority vested in me as President of the United States and as Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces of the United States, I have today awarded the Presidential Unit Citation for Extraordinary Heroism to the Studies and Observations Group Military Assistance Command. The Studies and Observation Group is cited for extraordinary heroism, great combat achievement, and unwavering fidelity while executing unheralded top-secret missions deep behind enemy lines across Southeast Asia. Incorporating volunteers from all branches of the armed forces, and especially U.S. Army Special Forces, SOG's ground, air, and sea units fought efficiently denied actions which contributed immeasurably to the American war effort in Vietnam. MAC VSOG reconnaissance teams composed of special forces soldiers and indigenous personnel penetrated the enemy's most dangerous redoubts in the jungled Laotian wilderness and the sanctuaries of eastern Cambodia. Pursued by human trackers and even bloodhounds, these small teams outmaneuvered, outfought, and outran their numerically superior foe to uncover key enemy facilities, rescue down pilots, plant wire traps, mines, and electronic sensors, capture valuable enemy prisoners, ambush convoys, discover and assess targets for B-52 strikes, and inflict casualties, all out of proportion to their own losses. When enemy countermeasures became dangerously effective, SOG operators innovated their own counters. From high-altitude parachuting and unusual explosive devices to tactics as old as the French and Indian War. Fighting alongside their Montagnard, Chinese Nung, Cambodian, and Vietnamese allies, special forces-led hatchet forces companies and platoons staged daring raids against key enemy facilities in Laos and Cambodia, overran major munitions and supply stockpiles, and blocked enemy highways to choke off the flow of supplies to South Vietnam. SOG's cross-border operations proved an effective economy of force, compelling the, the, Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese Army to divert 50,000 soldiers to rear arity security details. Far from the battlefields of South Vietnam. Supporting these hazardous missions were SOG's own U.S. and South Vietnamese Air Force transport and helicopter squadrons, along with U.S. Air Force forward air controllers and helicopter units of the U.S. Army and U.S. Marine Corps. These courageous aviators often flew through heavy fire to extract SOG operators from seemingly hopeless situations, saving lives by selflessly risking their own. SOG's Vietnamese naval surface forces instructed and advised by U.S. Navy SEALs boldly raided North Vietnam's coast and won surface victories against the North Vietnamese Navy while indigenous agent teams penetrated the very heartland of North Vietnam. Despite casualties that sometimes became universal, SOG's operators never wavered, but fought throughout the war with the same flair, fidelity, and intrepidity that distinguished SOG from its beginning. The studies and observation groups Combat prowess, martial skills, and unacknowledged sacrifices saved many American lives and provide a paragon for America's future special operations forces. Signed, the President of the United States, George Walker Bush. And that is the Presidential Unit Citation. Presented for those that served in Mac V SOG, the Studies and Observation Group in Vietnam. And for those of you that don't know what the Presidential Unit Citation is, it's an award that is given to whole units. Who, and this is this is the way they describe it, I quote, display gallantry, determination, and esprit de corps that sets them apart 
from other units. And you have heard about SOG on this podcast before. First from John Stryker Meyer, otherwise known as Tilt. And he was on podcast 180, 181, and 182. And then from his comrade in arms, the late great hero, Doug the Frenchman Letourneau. And it is an honor for us tonight to have another SOG warrior here. Henry Dick Thompson, codenamed Dynamite, and later known as the Terminator, who served as a SOG 1-1 and as a 1-0, and then continued on with 21 years in the Army, eventually retiring and having a whole nother career as a leadership consultant, author, and speaker. Mr. Thompson. And I know I should probably say Dr. Thompson because I know you got your PhD as well. If that, in, in case everything else was enough, sir, welcome to the program. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. Looking forward to it. So let's start at the beginning. Where'd you grow up? Uh, South Carolina, a little town called Walhalla. Uh, not far from Clemson University. So. And and what what years what what year were you born? Uh, Nineteen forty seven. Nineteen forty seven. So you kind of grew up in the fifties. Yeah, pretty much. And and then were you were you in a military family or anything like that? Uh, my father, uh, yeah, my father was uh, World War Two in Korea. Uh, my mother had five brothers. All World War Two. One was uh, killed, so I was around it, you know, right from the start. Because I, yeah, you know, our family was together a lot, so we had a lot of discussion, you know, about the war and things that were going on. And I was always asking questions and how do you do this and how do you do that and how do you organize. So I was interested, you know, right from the beginning. And your your dad was in World War Two and Korea. What was his job in the military? What branch was he in? He, infantry. So and he did work uh, with the Rangers for a while in World War Two. So. And so, would you hear him? Would he debrief you on the types of operations that he did in uh, World War Two in Korea? Some of it. Uh, he didn't talk a whole lot about exactly what he did, but he would talk in general about what was going on, uh, about the kinds of operations and things. So, what theater did he fight in? Uh, he was in in uh, Germany most of the time in that area. So. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And how long was he in the Army for? Uh, Army was about four years, and then he got out. And then when Korea came along, then uh, they called him back in. And that's really where I started to hear about it because I was old enough by then to um, hear people talk about Korea and about the war. And um, I would, you know, he would write letters home mm-hmm. and he'd talk about how deep the mud was or how cold it was and things like that. So uh, I was hearing about the war, you know, firsthand then. Mm-hmm. So, And were you thinking, I'm going in the military? I was probably four or five when I started thinking about that. <laughs> and um, interestingly enough, I, I did found, uh, find my old logbook. Because I also got interested in the in the Rangers, I wanted to be a Ranger when I went in. Mm-hmm. So I found a log book that I created when, you know, I was about nine or so when I created it. Uh, I had all the members of our Ranger company listed, which was primarily my cousins. But um, you know, we had some other people we had recruited in, <laughs> and um, we had the uh, journal of things that we did. Uh, people who got promoted. Uh, people who I court martial. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> were you guys doing night raids and stuff? Uh, we spent a lot of time in the woods. Yeah. I grew up in the woods. Um, you know, when I was five years old, when I get a chance, I'd go off in the woods by myself. I uh, go play. I'd track animals. I'd listen to the sounds. I'd learn how to move. By the time I was six, I had an army pup tent, and I would take up on top of the hill in the woods, put it up sleep up there by myself that night, take some eggs and stuff with me. I'd build a little fire, you know, cook. Uh, as I got a little older and had my BB gun, 
uh, take out some birds, roast them over the fire. <laughs> so doing things like that that I thought rangers did. So <laughs> You were the, uh, the six-year-old ranger, yeah. company commander. Getting after uh, it. Well, the logbook said General Thompson. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, that works. And then uh, what about high school? Did you play sports? Um, football and track. How, what was your athletic capability? Um, I was better than average on, on the team. I wasn't, you know, um, college material, but, you know, because I was relatively small, mm-hmm. but uh, I could hit really hard. <laughs> Uh, even my senior year, they even moved me from uh, running back to defensive end, which I was on a line that weighed over 200 pounds, and I was 140. <laughs> you didn't want to come around my end. Um, you know, my other skill was, you know, I was very fast. So when the quarterback had dropped back, he'd see me in his face because I could get there really quickly. So. And then, uh, so you, when you graduated high school, did you did you know you were going to college, or what was your plan? Yes. Yeah, I started college, and um, after about a year and a half, you know, Vietnam was going hot and heavy. You saw it on the news every night. Uh, what year did you graduate high school? Uh, 65. Okay, so yeah, I, I from what I can tell, because I wasn't alive then, but from what I can tell, the, the Battle of the Idrang Valley was in 1965, and that was kind of where the real – Hey, we're we're in combat all the time now. It seems to have that seems to be the pivot point that's noticeable when you look at it historically. Well, that was that was when I think we discovered the North Vietnamese had a real army, mm-hmm. and they were very good, much better than anybody thought at the time. Uh, and over the next few years, I mean, you you could place them probably in the top four in the world in terms of, of armies. Mm-hmm. Uh, plus, we were fighting in their backyard. Mm-hmm. They knew the terrain. They knew how to operate there. Um, they didn't stop. They just keep coming. Uh, their biggest disadvantage was they didn't have the technology that we did. They mm-hmm. didn't They didn't have air superiority. I mean, just a lot of things they didn't have that held them back, or it would have been much worse than it was. So it's 1965. Is the, that's when you said you graduated high school, right? And when you graduate high school, you go to college. Where'd you go to college? Uh, University of South Carolina. And then you said it was like a year and a half. Did you? What did you end up doing? Well, I, I made a decision that what I wanted to do was take a break from school because Vietnam was going on. I felt uh, an obligation, you know, to go do something, do my part, and. Actually, was on my way to the Marine recruiter because that's who you saw on TV every <laughs> night. Um, but stopped by the Army recruiter who was next door just to see what they had to offer. Um, so I went with the Army, and you know, I knew that would give me a chance to do the Rangers if I decided that's what I wanted to do. Um, but by then, I I was also a, a chemist, I, about thirteen. I developed a passion for chemistry. So in addition to all the outdoor stuff, you know, I was I set up my own laboratory uh, in the barn at home. <laughs> I spent all my money uh, on chemicals. And I know you like this, but back in the day, <laughs> back in the day, you could, you could go into a pharmacy and buy all kinds of things. I mean— you could buy, you know, nitric acid and all. I mean, just unbelievable chemicals, you know, you could buy, uh, particularly if you got your mother to sign for you and say, yeah, it's okay to let him have that stuff. And I would stock my my lab with it and do all kinds of experiments. Um, I, I was getting close maybe to um, a successful brain exchange between um, birds and frogs. Um <laughs> I could get it in there. I just couldn't get them, you know, to start breathing again <laughs> afterwards. So I have a lot of – That lot sounds of, close. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway. So were you studying chemistry in college? Yes. Yeah, I went to school on a chemistry scholarship. Uh, the intent was to be uh, – you know, get a doctorate in chemistry and be a researcher. But then uh, I decided to take the break, do three years in the Army, and mm-hmm. then come back and finish the degree. So it, so is it 1967 now? Went in 67. So it's 1967. How strong was, were the sentiments in America against the war? Very strong. In, in 67. Very strong. So that was already there. Yeah. 
What about in South Carolina? 